Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Biological Sciences Seminar. Uh, our guest speaker today is Simon Danner. Uh, he is an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Neurobiology and Anatomy at the Drexel University School of Medicine. Uh, he received his bachelor and master's degrees in medicine and computer science from Vienna University of Technology and a PhD degree in engineering sciences uh, from the same university. Uh, Simon did his postdoctoral training in clinical neurophysiology and computational neuroscience at the Medical University of Vienna and then at uh, the Drexel University. His graduate and postdoctoral advisors were Frank Rattay, Karen Minasian, Milan Dimitrievich, and uh, Ilya Rybak. Uh, in his graduate and postdoctoral research, Simon performed uh, neurophysiological studies of spinal uh, locomotor circuits in humans with spinal cord injury and also developed uh, computational models of uh, central control of interlimb coordination based on transgenic mice. And currently, Simon investigates the role of central and sensory inputs in control of uh, locomotion using computational modeling. And today, he will share with us his recent results. Simon, it's uh, all yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction and also for the invitation. Uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to present here. And uh, like Paulie said, like I'm going to talk about uh, computational models of interlimb coordination and uh, speed-dependent gait expression, and specifically also with a focus on afferent feedback. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please just feel free to interrupt me. Um, uh, so, yeah. That's good. Okay, so um, okay, so just to to start, so as uh, as uh, limbed animals increase the speed of locomotion, they generally change uh, the gait, which is partially defined by the interlimb coordination, also by the stance and uh, swing phases. So for mice, that means they get the slow uh, uh, speeds of locomotion. The uh, walk, which is characterized by uh, like quarter phase differences between the legs, and each leg uh, it moves uh, separately. So this is a four beat gait. Then, with an increase uh, of the speed, the animals start to trot, where the uh, diagonal limbs are synchronized and left and right alternation. You can see this here also, where the stance faces and the uh, are marked here for the four different limbs. And when the uh, speed increases further, uh, mice start to gallop where, where the left and right uh, limbs in the fore limbs and the hind limbs um, start to uh, be almost synchronized or quasi synchronized. And when the speed increases even further, uh, they bound and the limbs are fully synchronized at both girdles for the forelimbs and for the hind limbs. And at the same time, as you can see here, the stance phase duration decreases uh, dramatically while the uh, swing duration uh, stays more constant. So now, to start with, like, I want to ask the question of uh, how can spinal circuits be organized to produce the speed dependent gates? And to do this, I'm going to first present some already like previously published work on the central control and later on uh, uh, address the issue of uh, afferent feedback. So the main concept uh, for, for this model was that we have four written generators, one for each limb that controls uh, the flexor and extension phases or uh, or stance and swing, uh, if you want to interpret, interpret it this way. And these are connected through uh, commissural and long proprio-spinal neurons, which uh, couple the oscillators and determine their phase differences. 
And the oscillators, the, the written generators, receive a brainstem drive, which uh, puts them into a rhythmic regime. And with increasing drive, the, uh, this, the frequency of the oscillations increases. So this is this idea uh, from uh, the brainstem stimulation, like the decelerated crowd, where the increased stimulation uh, causes an increase in the locomotor speed. Here you can see the, uh, I think, the hip angles, and uh, and uh, the change in gait. So now let's start uh, from the beginning. Uh, let's see uh, how we model this uh, written generator. So the written generator uh, it consists of two uh, uh, two centers, a flexor center and extensor center, uh, that. Uh, are intrinsically rhythmogenic uh, because of a um, slowly inactivating uh, persistent sodium channel. They mutually inhibit each other. Now, the extensor center receives constant drive, while the flexor center uh, receives a drive that is uh, proportional uh, to the, the brainstem input for the locomotor speed or frequency. Now, if this, in this case, uh, here you have on the x-axis the brainstem drive, uh, the frequency increases with increasing drive, and uh, this is in the range uh, of uh, the frequencies used by, by mice during locomotion. And because of this asymmetric nature uh, of the drive, the extension phase duration uh, incre uh, decreases more uh, drastically with the increase in frequency, while the flexor phase duration uh, stays the more constant with like a slight decline. And, and now let's continue to the, the commercial interneurons, which are neurons that uh, project from one side uh, of the spinal cord to the other. And we can and, and couple uh, the the uh, the written generators. So we we can uh, we we model this uh, uh, on the basis of um, of genetically defined interneurons and specifically two classes: the V0 neurons and the V3 neurons. V0 neurons can be split into uh, V0D, which are inhibitory, and V0V, which are excitatory. And the uh, class of V3 neurons is uh, excitatory. What's that? Okay. Okay, I didn't understand you, so I just continue. Okay, so there's two pieces, uh, two main pieces of experimental data that. Um, that allowed us to identify the coordination uh, between or the, the, the connectivity between the uh, written generators that are mediated by uh, commercial interneurons. And the first one is the study by uh, uh, Belladita and Ole Kim in 2015. They investigated the, uh, the gate of um, of mice uh, lacking V0V neurons and also lacking all V0 uh, neurons. And uh, what they observed is that there's a loss of trot in the V0V, in the mice lacking V0V. As you can see here, uh, this is the phase, uh, the phase difference of the hind limbs, uh, zero signifying synchronization, uh, and one also synchronization, so it's a normalized uh, phase difference and 0 0.5 uh, indicating alternation. So this is the case of the V0V uh, uh, ablated mice. Uh, with increasing, uh, the low frequencies, the uh, left and right limbs are alternating, and uh, the transition to, uh, to left-right synchronization uh, happens at, uh, at the lower frequency uh, as the in the intact mice where uh, that would occur at a much higher frequency and speed. And the mice don't express uh, a trot, but instead of trot, they uh, gallop and bound already at this low frequency and speed ranges. 
when the V0, when all V0 neurons were removed, uh, there's left-right synchronization uh, throughout uh, the range of frequencies. So this gives us information about the speed-dependent role of these commercial interneurons. Now, the, the second piece of information, uh, main piece of information, uh, is about the long proper spinal neurons, and this is from the Sylvia Arbor Lab in this uh, 2016 paper with Rudo as the first author. And they identified the neurotransmitter type and uh, genetic uh, type of, uh, of the uh, long proper spinal neurons, neurons that project from the cervical enlargement to the lumbar enlargement or in the other direction from the lumbar to the cervical. And so we know that uh, there's a, there are V0 neurons and SHOX2 neurons that, uh, uh, that project from the cervical to the lumbar and also in the other direction. And, we, and there are no or very few inhibitory neurons uh, that are ascending. And additionally, they showed uh, that the removal of the descending long proper spinal neurons has uh, a transitory effect on, on the gait in which, uh, so here you see again the stance phases for the hind limbs and for the forelimbs. And uh, this is all at, the, like, at 40 centimeters per second. And here the, the stance in, marked in red indicate um, left-right synchronization and uh, uh, that occurs and it switches between alternation and synchronization when actually a trot would be um, the standard gait. And uh, this effect is uh, speed dependent, which is not shown here, and mostly affects the hind limbs. So with all this information, we were able uh, to identify a uh, uh, connectivity between the written generators that uh, that can uh, reproduce like all all these behaviors and the idea here is that the more behavior uh, the the model can reproduce the fewer possible uh, options of the connectivity are there but like you can like clearly never exclude any other like the any other options but so uh, so in here we see the left, uh, like left and right written generators uh, for one girdle. They are organized in the same way, where V0D uh, provides mutual inhibition between the flexor centers. V0B also provides mutual inhibition through uh, a pathway that involves V2A and uh, an inhibitory interneuron. So these two sets of interneurons provide left-right alternation because the mutual inhibition between the flexors uh, promotes alternation. And V3, we modeled here as uh, providing mutual excitation between the flexors and uh, promoting left-right synchronization. And we also have the uh, long proprio spinal neurons that uh, model in like a similar way. Uh, I'm not going to go in much detail because uh, it's very difficult to uh, to explain, and it will take uh, a lot of time to dive into the, actually all the uh, um, the mechanisms at play here. But V0V provides synchronization between the diagonal written generators, which causes uh, left right uh, well, not left right diagonal synchronization necessary for trot, and uh, the ipsilateral projecting ones. Uh, uh, they provide, these neurons provide uh, alternation between the fore and hind limbs, which is present during our gates. So then there's uh, one more thing that uh, was needed to, um, to produce the, the, all the gate transition, and this is the uh, the brains as uh, a brainstem drive, and uh, the brainstem drive to the commissural and uh, long proprio spinal interneurons. So this drive inhibits uh, V0, uh, all V0 interneurons, uh, and depends on the um, uh, and is proportional to the 
drive from the uh, to the flexor centers and what this does is it, it reduces the balance of the uh, neurons providing left right alternation and uh, uh, with the increase of frequency and uh, causes a transition to left right synchronization through the v3 neurons which uh, promotes the gate transition and again like the 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 idea for this type of organization is the observation that uh, with brain uh, that with brainstem stimulation, like with the increase in um, in drive, uh, not only the frequency changes but also uh, the gate. So now uh, here is the the result of the of the model. So we have the the whole connectivity uh, be, with. Uh, the genetically identified interneurons. And uh, now here's the simulation where we increase the drive for the, from uh, left to right. And the, the model uh, reproduces the, uh, the, the gate transition. You can see here the, uh, the extension phase uh, phases as the sparse for the hind limbs and for the forelimbs. Uh, and here the uh, outputs of the flexor centers. So with increasing, um, with increasing drive, the, the model uh, increases uh, the frequency and transitions from a walk with quarter phase differences to a trot. Uh, the range of trots is uh, uh, quite large in the sense of frequencies and then a, a gallop and a bound characterized by this left-right uh, synchronization. And additionally, it re reproduced the results of the removal of uh, commercial interneurons. Uh, just focus on, 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 on this, uh, in these three graphs here. The x-axis is, again, the brainstem drive. And here we have the phase difference between the left-right uh, hind limbs. Again, 0 0.5 means alternation. 1 and 0 means synchronization. And uh, with an increase in, in drive, uh, it stays at 0 0.5 until there's a bifurcation with a, uh, with a brief bistability to a gallop uh, and then to bound. Now, if V0V is removed, uh, this transition moves to the, to the left to lower brainstem drives and lower frequencies and uh, a loss of trot. The trot is here signified with the yellow and the, uh, the model only expresses a walk and then uh, gallop and bound. And if V0, V, all V0, V0, V and V0, D, so all V0s are removed, uh, there's only left-right synchronization and only bound is expressed. Uh, furthermore, it also reproduced the, uh, the transitory like, change uh, of, uh, of hind limb coordination uh, if the cervical to lumbar uh, non spinal neurons were uh, removed and uh, also replicates the, the speed-dependent uh, manner in which this occurs. So now uh, what conclusions we can we draw from this model? And uh, one of them is that clearly we have now a set of, uh, of, uh, of connections that uh, uh, that are of interest, uh, but also uh, um, we can now investigate how the model can change uh, locomotor gait and speed. So now if we change uh, the brainstem drive in an abrupt way, uh, it reproduces uh, relatively, so here we see it for mice and here in the model, uh, relative, like qualitatively the change uh, of gait and speed as is observed um, in animals with just like one, uh, one of few uh, tra uh, transition steps and between the change in, uh, in frequency and, um, and gait. But if we now uh, decouple the, the drive to the commercial interneurons from the uh, from the uh, drive to the flexor centers, uh, the model can change the gait with, uh, with only marginal changes in uh, the frequency by just modulating um, 
a mature or long propious spinal neurons. So from this model, we can suggest that commercial and long propious spinal neurons are the main targets for supraspinal and sensory inputs to adjust gait. And uh, that brings us uh, to now the, the, uh, the current uh, model that's uh, not yet published. And in this, we want to ask uh, how does afferent feedback interact with the spinal circuits to control locomotion at different speeds? Because so far, we only considered central interactions. Uh, and these could reproduce a, a, a significant set of experimental data, but we do know that there's interactions with afferent feedback, and uh, and this have been like ex abstracted away. So now we want to address this and look at afferent feedback. So how can we uh, accomplish this? So far, we we have like a central model that receives brainstem drives and uh, and consists of interconnected central pattern generators. Uh, now we want to look at the afferent feedback signals that uh, inter and how they interact with um, with this circuitry. So in order to do that, um, we have to build uh, a fully integrated neuromechanical model. And the reason for this is that the afferent feedback signals. Uh, depend on the state of the muscle and also on the muscle activations. And the state of the muscle, like the length, velocity, and the force uh, depend on the uh, state of the musculoskeletal system and its interactions with the environment, and also on the uh, muscle activations that come from the efferent signals uh, from the motor neurons. Uh, so, uh, that means that in order to uh, model afferent feedback, we have to build uh, a, a whole like neuromechanical model that is, integrates uh, the central uh, neural circuitry with a biomechanical model of the musculoskeletal system. And to do this, uh, the guy going to uh, walk you through walk you through in like a step by step way again. Uh, at first, uh, we need to uh, have the efferent uh, signals, uh, uh, specific uh, motor neuron activations, uh, and the model uh, should uh, create, uh, like, output these, uh, these uh, muscle activation patterns. So, so far, we had this uh, model, each limb was um, only controlled by a written generator, so uh, which produces flexor and extensor uh, uh, alternation and the flexor extension phases. But uh, in order to, which are clearly different from the uh, like specific muscle activation patterns. So in order to uh, obtain those, we have to model uh, a pattern formation network and uh, motor neurons. So this concept uh, builds on uh, Ilya Rybeck's uh, two-level uh, CPG organization, and uh, that consists of a written generator, pattern formation layer, and uh, then the, the motor neurons. So on the written generating uh, level, we have flexor extensor alternation, and uh, at the pattern formation layer, we uh, have a set of, uh, of pattern formation centers that produce basic activation patterns that uh, split the, uh, the written cycle into, uh, into different components that then are linearly uh, combined into uh, individual muscle activation patterns at the motor neuron level. So now, here we have the, the, the model results. So this is the written generating center. We have the, uh, the, uh, the neural output of the, the activity of the, uh, of the flexor and extensor uh, populations. Here from the contralateral flexor, we have alternation. We have the uh, flexor extensor alternation. Then this is the, uh, the output of the pattern formation centers. We in this case, a model is four, 
uh, and the uh, activities uh, uh, split the flexion phase in half and also uh, the, the extension phase with an early activity in the extension and the later activity in the extension phase. And uh, on the motor neuron uh, level, we modeled here seven uh, sets of major uh, uh, motor poles. Uh, uh, these patterns are linearly combined and produce uh, a profile uh, of uh, specific mu muscle activations uh, that like, reasonably well uh, uh, can reproduce what, what is seen in, in like EMG activity. Now, with an increase in drive, the frequency is increasing of the flexor centers. We have still the change of the left-right uh, uh, alternation to synchronization. And the, the patterns in, in the pattern formation layer uh, scale uh, with the frequency. And, uh, and so do uh, downstream the specific uh, motor neuron activation patterns as well. And this is how the, um, the implementation in the, uh, looks like. We, we have our written generator and we have four uh, pattern formation uh, centers that all mutually inhibit each other and uh, then project uh, to uh, the motor neurons where uh, flexor-related uh, centers uh, project to flexors and extensor-related uh, pattern formation sensor extensors and uh, bifunctional muscles can receive uh, both inputs. Okay, now we have the efferent signals uh, to drive the, uh, the, the muscles, so these are then uh, connected to uh, the muscles and actuate the muscles in the biomechanical model. So now uh, briefly explain like how we model the biomechanics. So we adapted this uh, model from uh, uh, the RAT model by AOE, uh, who in turn adapted this from uh, from Ekeberg and Pearson's uh, CAT model and we adjusted it for mouse parameters. Uh, and it's a reduced version in 2D. We model the hind limbs only, uh, three joints uh, per limb. In total, we have eight degrees of freedom and uh, seven uh, hill type muscles, uh, major hip, knee, and ankle extensors and flexors, uh, plus also two bifunctional muscles. And, um, and, uh, the proprioceptive feedback uh, the, and extraceptive feedback can be uh, calculated from the muscle velocity, muscle force, muscle length, and also from the ground reaction force. So we have 1A and type 2 spindle feedback, uh, we have 1B uh, Golgi tendon feedback, and uh, cutaneous uh, feedback from the plantar surface uh, of the feet. Okay, so now. Uh, now we we can finally come to uh, to the afferent signals uh, because with the uh, with the biomechanical model now we actually can calculate the afferent feedback signals and connect them to the uh, to the central uh, circuitry model and uh, this is uh, how we approached it so the feedback uh, can interact uh, with the uh, neural network model at any level and uh, specifically what we uh, implemented uh, is a connection to the written generator level where uh, iliopsoas and uh, TA spindle type 2 feedback excites the, the flexor center and uh, the inhibitor neuron that it inhibits the extensor center. So this uh, uh, has the effect of uh, if there's a hyper extension of the hip, uh, the the model uh, should uh, transition into a flexion earlier. Then we organized uh, Soleil's uh, and Gasognemus 1B feedback uh, and the cutaneous feedback from the plantar surface uh, to 
excite the extensor center and inhibit uh, the flexor center through the inhibitory uh, interneuron. And this has the effect that if the, or the proposed effect that if, um, if the leg is loaded, uh, the transition to uh, flexion is delayed. Uh, additionally, we implemented low-level uh, like reflexes and reflex pathways like 1A anonymous excitation, uh, 1A reciprocal inhibition, uh, and 1B uh, desynaptic inhibition and desynaptic excitation. So in order to, to find uh, the, the weights and muscle activation patterns, we use uh, and, and uh, the weights for the feedback uh, and the weights for the, uh, from the pattern formation uh, layer to the motor neurons, we used uh, 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 optimization techniques. It's a called covariance matrix adaptation uh, evolution strategy. And uh, that's uh, like a relatively well, like robust way of optimizing uh, nonlinear systems that uh, uh, and should be able to avoid a uh, local minimum. So for each, uh, for each run uh, of the simulation, uh, of the optimization, we simulated uh, 15 seconds of locomotion on a surface with randomized steps. The step size is randomized uh, with like a, like a specific limit, but uh, small steps that I always different for each run and 15 seconds on like a subtle surface where the, uh, where the slope increases and decreases uh, alternatingly. And the, we minimize the deviation from a target speed uh, while also minimizing the squared muscle activation and the forces and torques acting on the model. Okay, so now uh, the results. Um, the model was able to reproduce uh, to a walk at a uh, low frequency and speed. It can run. Okay, and uh, and hop or bound. So these are the uh, the main uh, three uh, gates. If we uh, just look at uh, at two limbs rather than four limbs. And uh, and uh, it walks at a slow speed, runs at a medium speed, and uh, and bounds at a higher speed. So so now uh, we can also look at the uh, the, the kinematics, the like joint angles, and uh, and also its stance uh, and stance phases and uh, swing phases rather than before extension and flexion phases, and. Uh, I have to note here that uh, for the optimization, uh, there was we did not include uh, uh, the the joint angles uh, or uh, the gate patterns. Uh, we only included uh, uh, we only included the speed uh, target uh, yeah, target speed uh, muscle activation and uh, and forces and torques acting on the system, uh, and we did not include the uh, to reproduce uh, kinematics. And here on the left side, we see the hip, knee, and ankle angles uh, from the model compared to hip, knee, and ankle angles from, uh, from, a, uh, from experimental data in mice by Tobi Akai. And uh, we can see that, uh, that qualitatively, uh, the model uh, reproduces the many characteristics of uh, of the kinematics, uh, even though it's like not uh, completely, uh, yeah, like like no complete quantitative match, but I think it's uh, it's like reasonably good. Uh, so, what else can the model do? We trained it on uh, changing surfaces, so the model can uh, can adapt uh, without any changes in the parameters to changes in slope. Uh, it can, so this, this simulations like the slopes uh, are just randomized with like a Bezier curve. And uh, it can do this uh, for 
the different gate types like walk, run, and hop, and can uh, and just simply adapt to, to the different slopes. So now we can also look at this uh, more analytically and uh, look at the steady state when the uh, when the model is is running on a level surface and on a, on a decline and an incline. You can see that the step length uh, is adjusted and also the, the step frequency and uh, and if we look at the uh, ankle EMG activities, are like well, not EMG but uh, um, motor pull activities, um, at the decline level and incline working, you can see that uh, the gastrocnemius EMG uh, activity is changing both, uh, in increasing both in uh, first duration and uh, amplitude with. Uh, when we go from a decline to level to incline uh, walking, you can also see the change in the frequency while the TA activity almost remains uh, the same. And what's interesting here is that uh, if we, if we uh, remove uh, 1V desynaptic excitation uh, during uh, the simulation in the uh, incline walking, uh, so here you see this like, stick figure, and uh, when the color changes from uh, from orange to blue, uh, the one B desynaptic excitation uh, is removed, and the model decelerates and eventually falls. So uh, this desynaptic excitation uh, is uh, is important to allow for the uh, incline uh, walking which uh, also increases uh, or is part of the reason for the increase in the extensor uh, activity uh, and the anchor extensor activity. Okay, so, but now we can also uh, investigate now what the, the effect on, on the afferent feedback or the role of afferent feedback uh, at different speeds. So, Specifically, we now look again at the uh, at the feedback to the uh, to the written generator, which is uh, the iliopsoas and, uh, and tibias anterior muscle spindle type two to the flexor and uh, inhib uh, and the inhibitor in neuron of the extensor center and the ankle uh, extensor one B and continuous uh, um, feedback from the plantar surface to the extensor and the inhibition of the flexor center. So if this feedback is removed uh, during, uh, during running, the, uh, the model immediately falls. Now, uh, when the model is walking slowly, uh, the removal of the feedback slows it down and uh, it doesn't fall, but it stops walking. And uh, when it's bounding, uh, the feedback uh, has an effect. Uh, we can see that it becomes like very unstable, but the model continues for like several steps. So, and eventually falls, I guess. Uh, but so that, that tells us that the, the feedback uh, has uh, different effects and different roles that depend uh, on, on the speed of locomotion. Uh, we can also look at 1A feedback, uh, which is uh, even more, uh, yeah, well, it's kind of like similar. Uh, it fast uh, walking, uh, here there's just a stick figure on the video. Uh, the, the removal, again, when the color changes, the feedback is rates are just set to zero. The removal of this 1A monosynaptic anonymous excitation uh, has uh, almost no effect. The model continues to run. There's some, uh, the steps like start to be a bit less consistent. Uh, but in the model that uh, uh, walks slowly, uh, the 1A feedback was necessary to, to keep the balance and it falls immediately. So this uh, suggested uh, that uh, uh, that uh, the the afferent feedback has uh, like different effects depending on the speed, as I said before. But 
Also, the afferent feedback uh, likely affects uh, frequency and speed as well. So what we did is we performed a sensitivity analysis by tubing uh, the different feedback connections with like a small uh, weight during uh, during uh, locomotion and uh, and measured the effect of uh, speed and frequency. So what we could identify is that uh, 1B desynaptic excitation to extend some motor neurons increases the speed. Uh, so does the cutaneous uh, feedback from the plantar surface to the extensor uh, to the extensor centers, not motor neurons. Um, and 1A uh, reciprocal inhibition increased uh, both uh, frequency and speed, while spindle feedback uh, from the uh, iliopsoas and TA to the flexor centers increased the frequency. Uh, 1A anonymous excitation decreased speed and frequency, and we, this is just a list of examples, but these are the, the most important uh, uh, impacts that we were able to, uh, to identify. So this uh, suggests that different strengths of feedback connections might be needed for slow and fast locomotion, because if the feedback uh, significantly impacts uh, the frequency and speed, uh, that must also mean that there needs to, like, that, uh, like, certain, uh, like, modulations of these feedbacks are more uh, uh, beneficial for uh, different speeds of locomotion. So, we already know from literature that there's like some uh, task dependent modulation of reflex gains between extending and locomotion as that the H uh, reflex is uh, depressed during locomotion uh, versus standing. And uh, the even more famous uh, example of uh, the reflex uh, reversal where 1B desynaptic inhibition is changed to excitation uh, from standing to locomotion which uh, also our uh, model actually uh, predicted as the optimizer completely removed the 1B desynaptic inhibition in favor of excitation when it trained for locomotion. So that might also suggest that our model has at least some uh, predictive power. Uh, and between slow and fast locomotion, uh, there's less uh, experimental data, but uh, there's in, an increase of the age reflex uh, threshold has been suggested, and also an increase of the cutaneous uh, reflex amplitude with an increase of, of speed of locomotion. So from this, we post the hypothesis that uh, supraspinal centers modulate uh, feedback gains uh, dependent on the desired speed. And more specifically, uh, we suggest that uh, this is uh, a task-dependent uh, or uh, state-dependent uh, modulation from like slow uh, walking, exploratory movement to uh, to fast or run uh, like faster locomotion. And this is in conjunction with the brainstem drive, which. Uh, acts on, as we discussed before, the written generator and the pattern formation and the commercial interneurons, which is ramping up. But we also suggest that there's now uh, a task-dependent modulation of the, the reflex gains, which uh, could be through like various different mechanisms, like uh, presynaptic inhibition uh, or also a modulation of uh, interposed interneurons or neuromodulators, uh, we don't pose here like a suggestion of the mechanism, but just that something uh, like that exists. And now if we model it in this way, the, the model can uh, walk at a slow speed, then when the color changes, uh, it transitions the, uh, the uh, reflex gains, and then uh, with a further increase can uh, increase the speed and, uh, and run and bound. and uh, can also directly change from walk to, to a bound. And uh, the model can still 
maintain uh, its ability to adjust uh, for for changing slopes and uh, different slopes uh, while changing the speed of locomotion. Okay, it's almost fell. Okay, so uh, this this is it. So, but uh, this model represents uh, just uh, a first a rough uh, rough idea of how uh, of how the uh, afferent feedback interacts with the, the central circuitry, and in the future we plan to uh, use this to re like further refine um, further refine the model and. Specifically, we can now also relate. Uh, we can relate behavioral data with uh, neural manipulations. We uh, we can uh, bring uh, certain experiments. Uh, well, relate certain experiments to uh, to to the connectivity experiment with different options of connectivity and. Uh, or reflex pathways and how they interact with uh, with the circuitry on the basis of genetically identified neurons, and ideally uh, this should be done by like coupling it with experiments that use the model uh, to predict uh, a certain outcome and then test that experimentally and keep refining. That's uh, what uh, Turga and I are planning to do uh, in the near future, and. Uh, and on the other hand, we are also looking into um, improving uh, the biomechanical model. Uh, so this is uh, these are two like screenshots of uh, or renderings of uh, a model that uh, Shravan Tata and uh, Auke Ipsbert uh, developed, and we are collaborating with them so that we can look at uh, quadrupedal locomotion and like. In in 3D and like increase like the detail uh, of the the biomechanical part of the model as well. Okay, with that, I would like to thank you for the for your attention and uh, acknowledge uh, the, my collaborators like Shinya Yi, Suichiro Fujiki, and Diana Gihara who were uh, instrumental in uh, in getting the biomechanical model to work and also sharing their um, their previous models and uh, Toga Kai and Olivier Laflamme, who uh, pro provided uh, data that uh, to compare the, the model to at different speeds and uh, inclines and so forth. And of course, uh, 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 my colleagues at the uh, Drexel University, Ilya Ryback, my former PhD advisor, who was like, very instrumental. Uh, Postdoc advisor who was very instrumental in uh, uh, in getting all of this uh, all this work to work, and uh, the same like uh, Sergey and uh, Natalia as well. And yeah, thanks. And if there's any questions, uh, please let me know. And this is this video is uh, from intermediary results where the model uh, like didn't do what I wanted it to do. So just in case you were wondering uh, or thinking that this will be like an easy work. Uh, you can see all the failed attempts here. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Simon. That was great. Uh, we have time for questions and uh, discussion. Uh, so please unmute yourself if you have questions. Um, okay. Can ask, uh, I can ask the first question. Uh, you have four uh, central pattern generators, one for each limb. Yes. How do you how do you set a rhythm generator that controls uh, all CPGs with the same uh, frequency? Uh, so, so the. Uh... The four written generators like each produce their own written, but uh, they also receive uh, ostensibly the same input from the brainstem drive. So, uh, in a normal circumstance, they uh, they would 
produce the same uh, frequency if there's no additional perturbations, but which of course occur. But uh, and this is uh, the the general rhythm is maintained through the coupling between the rhythm generators through the commissural and non proper spinal neurons, uh, and this coupling. Uh, maintains uh, the one-to-one the -one relationship uh, in uh, between the written generators. So there's not one uh, written that is uh, generated, but uh, it, it's four that is four the like, sources of the written that through the coordination between them are usually uh, synchronized uh, or like like phase lock. But if if you mm -hmm. would apply a strong enough perturbation, you, this could be broken. Like we we did the, the think about uh, like a split belt treadmill, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and on the other hand, uh, uh, we we also modeled this uh, in the case of V three neurons in the uh, in 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 vitro, where if you stimulate V uh, three neurons on one side, you get uh, 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 two bursts on, one, on the contralateral side, but only uh, like two bursts on the ipsilateral side, but only uh, one on the contralateral. So if the, the, the input perturbs them strong enough, uh, this coupling can break. I see. So despite the fact that you have a tonic drive from uh, the brain stem, uh, the you have the cadence, common uh, cadence for all uh, yes. uh, for the legs. Exactly. And I assume uh, it's an emergent property of the network. Yes, the exactly. Common okay. So if you uh, if if they would be un uh, not uncoupled, if they would be uncoupled, uh, they would start to diverge even. Like with, with any uh, perturbation, mm -hmm. okay. uh, but the coupling maintains the the one to one relationship. All right. Thanks. The questions. So, yes, a uh, very nice presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, nice work. I have many questions, but uh, I'll, I'll just uh, it would be nice to talk with you sometime. One thing uh, I was a little um, that I noticed was. Uh, your hypothesis about the role of supraspinal centers. And um, I wondered about that because, uh, as you know, the spinal cord can autonomously change its uh, gains um, as it does in responding to different spread, uh, treadmill speeds in a spinalized animal. So, um, where would you, where in your circuit would you place that sort of um, modulation in the spinal cord? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, let me go back a bit. So, uh, I can only come up with some suggestions, uh, but, uh, and we, we have to try this, and we have been thinking about this a bit, what happens after spinal cord injury, so you lose uh, the whole input here, uh, but uh, you still have afferent feedback to the, to the written generator, so if you have like any tonic uh, input, uh, this could be through electrical stimulation, uh, hip hyper uh, extension, or like uh, it could activate uh, the CPGs to, uh, or the rhythm generator to produce rhythmic activity. Uh, they might become hyper excitable through the like, plastic changes. Uh, and also, the phasic input uh, can entrain uh, this written if if the uh, written generator is in a chain in a, in, a, in a state that it is excitable enough. So the phasic input could entrain uh, the, the the stepping uh, into the, the written into the written generator if uh, if the feedback is strong enough and the the written generator is in the correct, uh, in a like reasonable state. Yeah, I see that. Thank you. Um, that does play into my next question, which, and then I'll stop after that. But uh, um, you know, uh, how are you distributing these the, the sensory feedback to the various pools? Um, 
I imagine you're using a cat model because we don't have good information on, on rodents. Yeah, so uh, we, uh, we, we, like I, uh, like we set certain uh, connections that we hypothesis to be true or that we, that are described in CAD, like, uh, like this, the regular, like reflex circuits, like 1A excitation, like reciprocal inhibition and so forth. And uh, to the uh, written generated tool, as they have been uh, hypothesized, also CAD experiments with uh, resetting. Uh, and, um, and then uh, we use machine learning pretty much to find weights that, uh, that can produce behavior that works. So that doesn't mean that these weights are in any way like, correct, but they can give us some suggestion. Like the one B uh, desynaptic inhibition was uh, removed uh, because it wasn't beneficial to to produce the behavior. So uh, what else we want to do is, like, especially with with uh, Turgai Akai, is uh, relate this to commercial or to the, or to. Uh, to genetically identified neurons or where we can play <coughs> and then and then test because we can use the model to predict behavior and uh, and, and, and see if, if certain connections are, are like are plausible or not so this is then like a laborious process of, uh, of figuring out iteratively thank you thank you can I ask a question Yes, please. Hi. Thanks, Simon. Very interesting talk. And thanks, Boris, for sending the links so <laughs> we can join this meeting. Uh, Simon, I was curious about, I mean, it's more kind of basic question at the beginning when you were showing this model. So you first had this very detailed model, which was, which looked very complex, right, with these neurons and everything. But then you showed this simplified model where you had only these errors showing these connections back and forth. And from those errors, I don't know whether it was implied like this. Uh, is the hind limb, fore limb connection, are you modeling this as a symmetric influence or is it asymmetric as it has been shown in the past? It's, it's asymmetric. Uh, it is asymmetric. <laughs> uh, Specifically, we uh, don't have inhibition from the lumbar cord to the uh, to the cervical cord, and uh, we and the excitation is actually stronger. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, this takes it. Yeah, the excitation from uh, from the lumbar cord to the cervical cord is is actually stronger in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, okay. so we, we we included uh, the information that we had, and uh, on the genetic type of the uh, especially the the lumbar to cervical projecting neurons, uh, we we know that V zero and uh, shox two neurons exist, but uh, there might also be other neurons. I think. At, they couldn't find any information on, uh, 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 yeah, on on the, the prevalence of uh, of other classes. Did you ever thought about trying to run the hind limbs and fore limbs at different speeds, and what happens to the other legs? Yes, that's a great idea. Uh, we we need. Four limbs uh, in the biomechanical model in order oh, to do that, yeah. so we don't have them yet. But yeah, <laughs> right. but that would be a great test to to see, uh, like to test the connectivity and uh, and see what can happen. Probably very similar to left and right, uh, mm. but maybe not. I don't know. We need to try it. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Richard Nichols here. Uh, Simon, that was a great talk, really, uh, really impressive. Um, some of our data is suggesting that actually during locomotion, there's not a complete replacement of, of inhibition from tendon organs with uh, excitation. In fact, there's a complex coexistence of the two. Um, and your optimization suggested that, in fact, uh, you had that the optimization uh, algorithm actually removed all of the inhibition. 
Uh, did you, I, I just don't remember, did you show this during downhill locomotion? Because our data suggests that inhibition is, is um, actually uh, increased during downhill locomotion from oh, experiment. That's, that's very interesting. Uh, so the, uh, the, the model doesn't change uh, the, the weights uh, of, the, uh, of the feedback uh, uh, during the simulation. So it, it tries to find a set of, uh, of connection weights that, that work for uphill and downhill. So uh, it might be that if we train it only for downhill locomotion, it could add this. Like, that would be very interesting if, if, it would, uh, if the model would do that. Okay, maybe we could talk about this uh, at some point in more detail. Yeah, that would be great, yeah. Very interesting. Okay, thank you. Time for one quick question. Uh, it's 12 o'clock. So, uh, R Richard Nichols and I were talking a moment ago, and um, I, maybe we both missed it, but uh, as you know, or may not know, uh, in the cats, after um, nerve section and then re of the muscles, when they walk downhill, um, they stumble. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think we both missed whether or not you had performed that experiment in your model. Uh, I did not uh, perform this experiment. It would be very interesting. Uh, which which muscles uh, like are denervated? Triceps serrae. They're okay. they're denervated, but then they are re-innervated. So then they are missing one A. Yes. Primarily, yes. Yeah. yeah We've done various combinations of the triceps serrae. Mm -hmm. I have to try this. Like I have not done this, but that will be something. That will be something interesting to try. I, I, I can do this and uh, I can let you know. Yeah, thank you. It would be very interesting. And of course, uh, we don't know what happens to group twos and um, nor one Bs. So, but we, we have pretty good, pretty good evidence for, uh, for one A's, uh, not only in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the cat, but also in the rat. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. So with this model, we can, uh, like, it, it's the great thing about modeling is you can just remove whatever you want and modulate whatever you want and see what happens. So uh, uh, we can, yeah, like, try what happens if you remove 1A and if you, what happens if you remove 1A and 1B. Like, it probably, it not necessarily will result in the same thing in the animal, but at least... Uh, we can learn something about the mechanism. Well, just as an endorsement for your modeling, I, I can speak for Richard and others and myself in saying that um, we would have saved many, many, many years of our lives if we uh, had, had uh, generated a model and, um, and been able to make predictions from it. So That's we're, for sure. We're, uh, we're looking forward to your model and, uh, and um, taking it to the laboratory. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I hope that it will be as useful as uh, as I hope it will be as I think now. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks very much again, Simon. That was a fantastic presentation.